Hi, my name is Steve Miller. One of the things that my dad really wanted to know was how did he get to the United States from where his grandparents grew up? So I decided to go in and create a paternal family tree that traces back as far as I could on my father's father's side. So here's a picture of my dad at various stages of his life. And this is where he grew up. He grew up in Iron City, Georgia, which is in southwest Georgia. So how did a man in southwest Georgia get here from his family tree? I was able to trace his tree all the way back to the 1500s. In 1564 was the earliest record I could find. And at that time, they came from Hellsmurth, Germany. His name was Hans B. Mueller's, and his wife was Anna. He was 50 years old when he died. During this period of German history, the country was deeply divided, both politically and religiously, between Protestant and Catholic, and it led ultimately to the Thirty Years' War from 1618 through 1648. Today, Helmreth is a travel destination, not too far from Cologne and the famous Cologne Cathedral. In fact, my wife and I visited Cologne a few years ago on some travels. As you can see from the map below, Helmreth is in the eastern middle section of Germany. Now Hans had a son named Simon. Simon was born in 1597, and he ultimately married Anna Marie Arnold. This was my father's ninth grandfather. He was just 53 years old when he died. His son, David, was born in 1615 in Nassau, Germany. That's only about 38 miles from Helmeroth. His wife, Anna, died in 1646, and she was just 52 years old. His father was 33, and his mom, Anna, was 32 when they had Simon. Notice that Simon dropped the S from Mueller's, and the last name became Mueller. Here's a picture of the Nassau Castle in Nassau, Germany. I thought it'd be interesting to go back to Helmreth today and see what it would look like. So let's take a look at a video of what that beautiful countryside looks like today. As mentioned earlier, Simon had a son named David. David moved about 38 miles away to Nassau, Germany. You can see on the map where that is. David died at only 73 years old. His father was 18 and his mom 22 when they had David. He lived during that 30 years war. This religious war between Protestants and Catholics gradually developed into a political war involving most of Europe. The war caused famine, disease, and reduced the German population. At this time period, Germany saw a rise in German literature. Many writers reflected about the horrible experiences from the Thirty Years' War. I started wondering what it looks like in Nassau today. Take a look at this video. Here's how the beautiful countryside set up today.
As mentioned earlier, David from Nassau had a son named Johan. Johan was born in Leech, Germany, which is just 65 miles away from Nassau. That tells me that David must have moved to Leech at some time in his life. He lived to 80 years old. That's the longest age that I could find in our lineage up to this point. But his wife only lived 43. Now his father, David, was 24 and his mom was only 19 when they had Johan. There was no significant destruction in Leech during that 30 years war, so that may have been why Johan migrated there, he and his father. That's just speculation, but just an idea. Here down below on this map, you can see how the four generations of Moors moved from Helmreth to Nassau to Leech, and then later on to Kurtwork, which is about 29 miles from Nassau. This made me wonder what Leech looks like today. Let's take a look at the video. So Johann from Leech had a son named Michael. Michael was the first one to migrate to the United States. At the time, it wasn't the United States. It was still part of the British colonies called the United Colonies. This was back in 1681. Michael, he was married to a lady named Christine. And when he moved to the United States, which was then Britain, he changed his name from Mueller to Miller. It sounded more British at the time. He was born in Leeds, Germany, moved to Kurtoff just before moving to York, Pennsylvania. He lived to the most impressive age that we've seen so far. He was 91 years old when he died, and his wife was an incredible 106 years old when she passed away. Now, I took a look at the U.S. immigration list, and I could see that Michael arrived in Philadelphia in 1741 at 60 years old and he immigrated with his wife and five children. He received a land grant in York, Pennsylvania, and there's a grainy picture on the screen here of that land grant. Now, Germans immigrated to escape the devastation of the Thirty Years' War and subsequent wars that happened with France. The government provided land grants to Europeans, mostly farmers and tradesmen, who were willing to commit to a seven-year agreement to work setting up these Pennsylvania towns. So by the time the Revolutionary War in 1775 came about, where America became America, there were almost 100,000 Germans in the United States. York, Pennsylvania served as a temporary capital of the Continental Congress from 1777 through 1778. This was in the early stages of the Revolutionary War. Let's take a look at what York looked like today.
Looking at the Pennsylvania land applications, it shows that Michael received 40 acres of land in 1767 in return to coming to the United Colonies. So let's look at Michael's son. His son's name was Andrew. He was born in 1712. Now he was born in Germany, but came over to York with his father. He died at just 60 years old, but his wife lived to 84 years old. Before immigrating to York, his name was Andreas Mueller, and it was changed to Andrew Miller once his migration was complete. Andrew and his wife Barbara had 18 children together. Andrew had a son named Jacob. Jacob was married to Mary Elizabeth. Jacob was born in 1729, and he was my father's fourth great-grandfather. He was the first in our paternal family line to be born in the United Colonies, now the United States. He was born in Faulkner Swamp, Pennsylvania, about 30 miles from Philadelphia. His father and his mother had him when they were both 17 years old, and he lived until he was 78 years old. He was a member of the, the Faulkner Swamp Reformed Church. Jacob had a son named William. William Buck Miller, as he was known, owned land in Oglethorpe, Georgia, but he moved to Live Oak, Florida to fight the Indian Wars in 1837, and he died there in Live Oak, Florida at the age of 69. He was my father's third great-grandfather, and as you can see here, there's a picture of he and his wife. The Seminole Wars were started because slaves regularly fled from Georgia into Florida, and they assimilated with Seminole tribes. Andrew Jackson demanded Seminoles leave Florida to migrate to the West, but this culminated into one of the longest and most deadly and expensive of all American Indian Wars. Most of the Seminole population had relocated to Indian country or killed by the 1840s, though several hundred Seminoles settled in Southwest Florida and were allowed to remain in an uneasy truce. Looking at William Buck Miller's grave, you can see that he was in the militia for the Indian Wars. Now, William had a son named John. His name was John Harrington Miller. He was also born in Oglethorpe while they were there, and they, he eventually moved to Colquitt, Georgia. He was married three times, and he died at 67 years old. He had the first horse-drawn cotton gin in South Georgia, located in Seminole County, known as Ash Estate. The well where the horses were watered is still there today. John owned a large estate in Seminole County and sadly was a slave owner. There's a document here that shows where he purchased a slave, and I've been told that he had 18 slaves at one time. In 1845, John saw a need for a burial place for his family and the slaves who worked his estate, and he set aside two acres of land on lot 167, now known as the Miller Cemetery. Miller Cemetery is divided into two sections, one for the descendants of John and the other for his 18 slaves. He's also owned Miller Sandbar, located on Spring Creek, allocated as a place to swim and baptize new converts. I remember swimming at Miller Sandbar when I was a kid. The cemetery is still there, and the graves uh, for John and his descendants are also there. Just looking at the Miller Cemetery, you can see that uh, a lot of his children are buried there, his relatives are buried there, and it's a sizable graveyard even to today. John Harrington Miller had a son named William Green Miller. When he was born, his father was 25 and his mother was 19. He was married to a lady named Mary Elizabeth, Lizzie Williams, as they called her. He and Lizzie had 17 children and died at the age of 78 years old. This guy is one of my favorite people in our past. The reason is, at the onset of the Civil War, William had a strong conviction against slavery, and he decided to fight for the North, or the Union, instead of the South, or the Confederates. He enlisted in the 10th Regiment in the Ohio Cavalry on May 10, 1864, in the Union Navy. He saw action aboard gunships that patrolled the eastern coast of the United States. He obtained rank of landsman and was injured in his hips and back when the chamber's ship capsized during blockade duty. Due to the sinkage of the ship, he contacted yellow fever and was transferred to the steamer Unadilla. 
He was taken to Fort Fisher, North Carolina, and was under Union control and later transferred to New York City at the close of the war. He was discharged on May 4, 1865. At that time, he returned back to Iron City, Georgia. He married Mary Elizabeth Miller from Brinson, Georgia, and he carried on his father's farming operation until his death on January 6, 1924. He's also buried in the Miller Cemetery. This was my father's first great-grandfather. He had a son named Seaburn. When Seaburn Granberry Miller was born, his father was 29 and his mother was 25. Seaburn was married to Perlene Shires in Jackson, Florida on December 5th, 1901, when he was only 26 years old. Perlene died in a really freak farming accident at only 33 years old. They were stretching fence wire. The fence wire stretchers broke and the handle hit her, instantly killing her. Here you can see a picture of Seaborn and Berlin. A year later, Seaborn married Mitty Sephornia Yawn. Seaborn died at the age of 63 and Mitty at the age of 73. You can see his grave at Enterprise Free Will Baptist Church, just up the road from my dad's house. He had a son named Ora. We called him Calvin. Ora Calvin Miller was born on July 2nd, 1910, when his father Seaburn was 35 years old and his mother Perlene was 29. He married Murtis Mayon on January 5th, 1929, and had three children, James, L.D., and John D. John D. is my father, so that was his father. That was my grandfather. Calvin was a farmer and sustained his family on his farm of 85 acres in Iron City, Georgia. He built a farm on this land, which later burned, but then he rebuilt a new farm on that same land, and it's now owned by his son, John D. Miller. He was a heavy smoker, and he had lung cancer, and he died at an early age of 69. That was on April 6, 1980. His wife, Murtis, died at the age of 79, and that was on August 13, 1992. They are both buried at the New Enterprise Free Will Baptist Church. Here's a quick video that shows their home at the time of their passing. So now let's take a look at New Enterprise Free Will Baptist Church and where my grandfather and grandmother, Laura Calvin and Murtis May, are buried. So this takes us to the man of the hour, my father, John D. Miller. I also wanted to say a special thing about his mother, Murtis. We grew up to know her very well, and uh, we were very fond of her before she passed. But John D. Miller, he was born back in 1936. He grew up on his father's farm that we showed you earlier. In his first marriage, which was my mother, Linda Jane Bettison, he built a house on Bartow Gibson Highway, where he still resides. And he had three children, Cindy, Christopher, and me, Stephen. After a quick career in a boat factory, he sold life insurance for Interstate Life Insurance Company and won Salesman of the Year Award many times. Later, he started a construction business, building homes around Seminole County area. In fact, I helped him build some of those homes in my, when I was in high school. 
In the late 1970s, he bought and ran a service station in Donaldsonville, Georgia, called Seminole Auto Supply. And I worked at that station from when I was 12 years old until I went off to college, and I loved that station. John built a beautiful home on Lake Seminole all by himself, where the family enjoyed swimming, fishing, and water skiing. In 1980, he and my mom, Linda, divorced, and they sold the lake home. Several years later, he married Joyce Hines and helped raise their grandkids, Christy and Miranda. They expanded his farm, and he began farming full-time. Joyce died of cancer on September 18th, 2016, at the age of 77, and is buried at New Enterprise Free Will Baptist Church. John still lives in his first home on Bartow Gibson Highway and enjoys looking after his livestock, tending to his garden, spending time with his kids and his grandkids and even his great-grandkids. And he loves fishing and taking care of the Miller Cemetery. I try and go over and fish with my dad once a week whenever I'm in town, and we really enjoy spending time together. Now let me show you a little bit about his farm. 